Hi, this is Brandy Shantz, and you're listening to Living Chronic. Today, I'm speaking with Marissa Spratley, and she is the Manager of Fundraising Campaigns and Volunteer Engagement at the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. She's also a Crohn's patient. So welcome, Marissa. Hi, thank you. So I we haven't even started this podcast yet, but I'm already hoping that this is the first of many to come because you and I have such a similar similar story. Yeah. We've been through many things that are almost the same. And you're the first person I've met who really just went through. I've met a lot of people who've experienced drug-induced lupus. I've met a lot of people who, you know, suffer from Crohn's or UC. But our lupus, drug-induced lupus experience was very similar. So, um, you know, I just think that there's so much that, uh, you know, we can do together. We, we've talked about that before because... Gosh, you know, good intentions and bad luck, I guess. So, right, exactly. <laughs> started. Tell me um, a bit about your story. Oh, sure. Okay. So, I was first diagnosed with Crohn's disease in um, 2016. And so, I had actually just graduated from college and I was in like my first um, full time job after college, my first job at all after college. And it was like two months in um, to that job where I was working at a desk and um, I was having to like run to the bathroom like upwards of 20 times a day. And it was just to the point where um, I was so fatigued from having like no nutrition in my body that I would, you know, wake up, go to work, come home and just go right to bed. I wasn't eating dinner. I wasn't really doing anything or socializing. And I just remember being like really exhausted all the time and thinking like, is this normal? Is this just like how the work-life balance is? Um, and so finally I decided I needed to like talk to someone about it. Um, and thankfully my boss at the time actually had a brother with Crohn's disease. And so she was, she had mentioned to me, like, I noticed that you have to run a lot um, to the bathroom during the workday. I think you should really get it checked out and see a gastroenterologist. Um, and thankfully I did. Um, and at that point I had struggled like often on my whole life with like IBS like stuff and, um, joint pain, like weird. So I'd always had like weird health things like come up a lot, but I'd never been able to connect all the dots. And so, um, I saw a gastroenterologist and was diagnosed with, um, inflammatory bowel disease. And at that point it was, um, my, my diagnosis with the, was ulcerative colitis at first, um, cause I had so many, um, ulcers in my colon at the time of the, um, colonoscopy I had on like every two centimeters. So he definitely thought it was more ulcerative colitis based. Um, and I was put on like the standard first drug, um, salamine and told to go my way. Um, so I was, you know, taking like six pills a day, which was nothing at that point is nothing to me now. Now, how many I take now, yeah. but, um, and nothing really changed. I didn't change my lifestyle. I kind of didn't really have a whole lot of thoughts around it. I was just like, okay, this is now something that's going to happen. Um, and until I got really sick, uh, about a year later and I started to, um, have like a lot of extra intestinal symptoms. So I switched and started going to the university of Maryland, um, medical center, have a great doctor there. Um, she performed the colonoscopy and diagnosed me with Crohn's disease instead um, and immediately started me on um, Remicade. So I started um, infusions every uh, six weeks. And um, at first it worked really well for me. So for about six months, I felt like pretty good um, with my like gastro issues. Um, when I say pretty good, I mean like, you know, better than I was, but not great. Yes. <laughs> Good is always relative. When it's relative. Chronic illness. <laughs> so yeah, at that point, before I started that, I was going to the bathroom like 30 times a day. So it like, it, there's like, you know, uh, only so much worse it could get in that context. But um, when I started the Remicade, it um, just like took a lot out of me. It, it like was hard on my body from the get go. Um, my second infusion, I had an anaphylactic reaction. So um, whenever mm -hmm. I was having infusions from then on, I was always having to get IV Benadryl and like uh, saline bags and they had to do them on like a very slow rotation. So it took like four hours overall the whole time I was there, um, which is, you know, it was exhausting. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And then I think after about six, just it wasn't a long time, six months of my first biologic drug too, is when I started having just like 
I'd always had like a little bit of joint pain, but it was to the point, I mean, at my worst, it felt like my, it felt like my muscles were being, um, snapped. Mm -hmm. It felt like they were snapping. I would go to take a step and it, it felt like all of the muscles in my legs and my back, um, were just like snapping or like they were like made of ice and were just being broken. <laughs> like it just felt yeah. like this most excruciating pain. Um, going up and down stairs was like killer. And I remember at that time I lived in like a basement apartment. So I was going down a long set of concrete stairs. Um, and it was cold in that, um, uh, stairwell too. And so like going down those stairs, I just remember every time I would put a foot down, it was like just screaming pain. Every, it felt mm -hmm. like every tendon was being snapped. Um, and, and, you know, at that point, um, I thought it was just like joint pain. I thought it was like kind of associated with the disease. I started seeing a rheumatologist and they diagnosed me with um, rheumatoid arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis. So um, basically just some inflammatory based arthritis and uh, inflammation of the spine. So I thought, okay, like, you know, it's just that, but from a kid's supposed to treat those two. And so I thought I just needed to give it time so I continued on um, and I probably stayed like like that for about six months where I just didn't do anything because I thought it was normal um, and it couldn't be helped kind of thing. Um, and then it got so bad where I lost function of my hands and they were just like these claw like things. <laughs> so yes. they were like this because they were so, my fingers were so swollen. They were like double the size. My knuckles were huge and just like absolute claws I'd have to um dip them in ice baths I would get like buckets and just like hold my hands in the ice baths thinking it would help with the swelling it didn't it still hurt <laughs> um I did a lot of I, I swear I tried like everything like the essential oils and the the like CBD balms thinking could help and I I tried like CBD tinctures because they're good for inflammation. Any kind of vitamin that was good for inflammation, I was taking. Um, drinking like turmeric tea, like all of the things. Um, I used heating pads religiously, <laughs> uh, but nothing was helping. And then I started to lose the ability to walk. Um, like I could walk, I couldn't. I I could walk with extreme amounts of pain, but I would fall because it was so hard to put one leg down. So it was like, I, you know, I couldn't walk because of the pain. And so I just was um, really like laying in bed and, and not able to do much. So I didn't go to work for about a month and it happened to fall over the holidays. And it was just, um, you know, the time of year was cold out. So it was just like a lot of uh, like snowball effect. Um, mm -hmm. And that's when I realized like, okay, this probably isn't normal. Looking back now, I just should have definitely gone to the ER um, multiple times during all of this. But I honestly was just like, they're just going to tell me like, you know, there's nothing they can do. Um, it's about like finding the right drug for my body. And, you know, maybe this is better than having like the worst GI symptoms I could be having. I just like, wasn't, I wasn't like aware. I didn't know what to do. Um, and when I finally saw, saw my doctor again, the January after um, is when she was like, okay, this isn't normal. So I started seeing her, the rheumatologist, lots of doctors trying to piece it together, figuring out what was going on. And it probably took another few months of just seeing lots of people for them to finally be like, okay, let's take you, you take you off of the Remicade. It's not helping your body at this point. It's only hurting. Um, and I started a high dose of steroid and all that stuff um, mm -hmm. as well. There's a little bit, that was a long version, but. <laughs> you know, it's, I, I really relate with everything you say, you know, you're going through this and the first thing you think is, well, must be something with the Crohn's disease. I have all the inflammation. Right. So it's clearly the Crohn's or, you know, the other diseases I may have in conjunction with Crohn's because one autoimmune disease usually brings one or two friends. Um, yeah. And you do kind of feel crazy. Yeah. It's interesting. You never went to the ER. I did. I, I don't know why I did it, honestly. You know, I went and, you know, one time I went, I did think I was having a heart attack because I was mm -hmm. having the numbness in my arm right. and chest pain. And I thought, well, that's definitely a heart attack. And of course they tested my heart, everything was fine, but still no doctor noted that it was probably my drug causing that right. kind of thing. 
And even when I lost my ability to walk like you, I'm going in to see doctors and, you know, like, well, yeah, it's not normal for somebody to just stop being able to walk, but I don't know what it is. So even still, it took so yeah. long to hear those words, drug induced lupus. It, it, it did for really me too. I remember, I, f I feel like the reason I didn't go to the ER, I think I was um, preemptively telling myself no, because I felt like I was going to be told no kind of situation mm -hmm. where, you know, I thought they'd just be like, this is just you. This is just how it's going to be. This is maybe it's all in your head kind of thing. Like you look fine, you know? So exactly. I mean, real fear. You I know? was just scared of it. And I think too, I was so honestly, I was so depressed by it um, and immobilized to where like, I couldn't even get on my phone to like, look up if this was normal and look up things if I wanted to, because my claw hands could not, I literally couldn't even go like this. Like the smallest tweak of my thumb set like a huge shooting pain down like my whole arm. So it was just like, I was so exhausted that I felt like I had no options um, to be able to like advocate for myself. Like, I don't think I could have advocated for myself in that situation if I went to the ER or a doctor and they told me like, no, you're fine. Or like, you're imagining this or like, you know, it, it's just your this, or it's just your that. I think I would have just broken down. And so I think I protected myself from that a little bit. No, you're right. Um, we've talked about this before. It's a very traumatic experience. It's very traumatic. And the depression, um, you know, I had very, you know, it was very suicidal at times, you know, right. And you're trying so hard, but you know, nobody's able to tell you what's wrong. And you start to get scared to ever go to a doctor because you just don't want to hear those words. It's nothing. Exactly. Or, you know, it's in your head or, you know, the worst of the worst, you know, are you eating gluten? <laughs> you know, yeah. You know that take away your ability to walk. Um, so you, you, you get scared, you protect yourself. Who wants to hear that? Um, exactly. I still do it. Even after everything I've been through, uh, if I'm, I have problems, my husband will say, why don't you go to the doctor? And then I'll say, what's the point? Right. <laughs> you know? yeah. I'll just sit here and see if it goes away. Definitely. So it's very real fear. Um, yeah, I think I um, it was just, it. yeah, the, the, the mental health side of it was just so overwhelming that you have to have some sort of motivation to like get help, right? Like you have to be like, okay, the pain is driving me crazy. Like I have to get help, but I was so unmotivated and I just had like, like zero lack. I mean, I had the complete lack of like drive to do anything, like to bathe, to get out of bed. Like I would just move from the bed to the couch some days and some days not at all because I couldn't even make it that far. Like there was yes. no amount of like, um, self-care going on because I couldn't do it. Like eating was hard. Just yes. because it hurt, you know, so. Mm -hmm. I, I cannot overstate the mental health aspect of this. I think I've often said when we're diagnosed with a chronic illness, we immediately need to, you know, when they give us that referral mm -hmm. to the GI or whoever your specialist is, we need that referral to a mental health professional immediately. And that per person yeah. needs to be a member of our team. Um, and it should be so hand in hand. Yes. You know, and I think we're, we're all very strong people. We, we, we know that better than anybody, right? right? Like if we say we're in pain, that means everybody stops. Something's happening. Bad. Yeah. So I felt, you know, as hard as it was painful, uh, I think the mental health was the hardest part of it. I think that was the one that almost yeah. sunk me. That was, that was what almost sunk, sunk me. It was the mental health, not the pain, which is what's so interesting. Exactly. Because it, it feels so isolating. You feel so completely, utterly alone when you go mm -hmm. through it. And you think like, well, first of all, it's so hard to put into words, right? Like the mm -hmm. only way I found of describing it, like I said, is like using the image of like, I had claw hands because I literally couldn't, I could not open my hands. And the, mm -hmm. the mental image of like every tendon in me snapping is how it felt. But like, no one can really, if you've not gone through it, you can't like understand what, what you mean. But yeah. I had such trouble communicating it to people when I was going through it, right? Because I was like, 
like all I know is I'm in extreme pain. I'm so swollen and everything hurts. It hurts to breathe. Yeah. So, you know, um, it's hard to really communicate that though on like what level can someone who's not going through that understand what you mean? No, exactly. And I mean, I remember when I first uh, started talking to doctors about what I was experiencing, I kept saying, I feel like I'm in overtraining syndrome, but it can't be that because I'm resting and I'm still not mm -hmm. okay. And then the other thing I, because for me, the worst pain came in my quads mm. and it felt like this sharp stabbing pain, like some, like somebody had just torn my quad and it just felt so bad. Yeah. And they just looked at me like I was crazy. They were like, well, stretch. And I'm like, no, no, stretching is yeah. nothing. I was like trying to get a note from my massage therapist, like write a note to the doctor telling him that you can't unknot my muscles. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so it's hard to explain to anybody what you're feeling. You know, it's just, how do you put it in words? We need to come up with a graphic and then send that to doctors so that they can understand what we're trying to say when we say pain, drug-induced lupus, pain. Yeah, definitely. And I don't know if doctors will ask you this at the time, but I remember my doctor's office, my gastro office and um, rheumatologist's office, whenever I'd go in, they'd be like, okay, on a scale of one to 10, what's your pain level today? And it's just so funny because it's so, it's also relative, right? Like now I go in and I'm like, I'm at a zero because <laughs> compared to the pain I felt, nothing ever comes close to that. Right. And so at that point, looking back, I was at a 10, I was at an 11, like, but when I was going to the doctors, I was so scared of them, like, questioning me. I would be like, I don't know, like, maybe like a six. I'm like a five. <laughs> if, if I couldn't walk, if I couldn't use my hands. I know. If I couldn't, like, you know, like, move my pinky that much. You're at a 10. Like, that's, that's full pain. Yes. Well, you know what's interesting? I think occasionally there's a doctor that really gets it mm -hmm. and they know a chronically ill person when they say when we say i'm in pain it means okay this is a new chart new chart this they, they get a different chart yeah and the doctors could never they were like well, i don't you know we've done the test i don't know and you know there's been a handful of people throughout this process that i just look back and i think thank goodness that person was there yeah. i was so frustrated I was, I, I was just blazing through doctors when I couldn't find help. I'm like, fine, I'm going somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And I went to, I stopped going to Walter Reed because it was so difficult to get in to see any specialist there at the time. And I only had the primary care and my, I was just not happy with them, obviously. I mean, they were of no help. So I switched right. over to Joint Base Anacostia and they weren't helping me either. And I just needed one referral. I was like, look guys, just let me go to Georgetown and let me move this party over there and see if they can't help me. And the doctors were just like incompetent and I could barely move. You remember those days when you can't mm -hmm. walk in there in pain. And I somehow pulled myself into my car and drove to JBAB and I'm trying to get out of my car and get to yeah, the which end. Is, which is literally, like, I can't imagine. I mean, cause I don't know how driving at that point, like, cause your hands are so, it's so hard just to drive because you can't really steer. I mean, even just like, so like I said, it was like my hands and then like my back into my legs. So even just like putting your foot on the gas could send like the pain. I can't I, imagine. I was pale because, you know, you know, it is when you're that much pain, you're going pale, everything, you know, and I'm doing this slow. I'm like leaning on these railings. It's taking me like an hour to get from the parking spot right next to the yeah. door, to the door. And I finally get inside in this woman sees me and she's not a doctor. She's not one of the medical professionals at all. She was a member of admin staff. Yeah. Yeah. She was just a contract employee. I, I don't know which company she worked for. Give that woman all the bonuses, please. But she sees me and she's like, oh, I will fix this for you. And she, oh. she gives me her email address yeah. and her phone number. And she says, be, be, you know, she's like, you, be better, be careful, you know, try to, you know, take care of yourself. I got this. And she did. She, she got me in to see wow. all the doctors I needed to. And that's eventually I did get the diagnosis. So thank goodness for the random people that show up. Right. In your life. No, honestly, I mean, I, I was very, very lucky. And like, I had really a lot of privilege going into it because I was at a really good, like facility. I had great care. And honestly, my doctor like saved my life. Um, she, when I finally was able to voice like how much pain I was in and how much I was suffering, 
she immediately was like, well, that's not okay. Like the quality of life that you have right now is unacceptable. And if it means that you fail this biologic after only a year in your early twenties, so be it. Like it, it's not worth it and moved, let's move on. Um, so I'm really grateful for her, honestly, and her whole care team. I think I almost like, it's so emotional for me to go back to that doctor's now because every time their staff sees me, they're like, gosh, you look so good. Like, we're so happy to see that you can walk in here and like, you're by yourself. You could never come by yourself before, right? Like, because I just, I couldn't drive myself. I couldn't get myself from the parking garage to the, the, the building and all that stuff. Um, and you know, they're just, they're so sweet and kind and like, whenever they ask, they still ask like my pain scale. And if ever I say like zero or one, they're like, God, I'm so happy to hear that. And if I ever yeah. do a pain, they're like, Oh, like I, I hate that for you. Like they're just so like caring and in tune. And honestly, I have to say like out of that whole experience, like, like my doctor, obviously I'm very thankful for, but it's like, it was the infusion nurse who, when I had the anaphylactic reaction, like saved my life literally. And like the, the office staff who, when I walked in, were the first people I saw and were like, oh my gosh, come, let me get you a chair. Like yeah. their kindness literally meant like the world to me. Cause at that point, like you feel so hopeless, you feel so lonely and isolated. And so every little kind gesture like that just like means the world. It changes things. It really does. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just so helpful, I think, you know, for everybody out there who may be experiencing this or who has experienced it, to just meet someone else who's gone through it, that alone just just makes you feel like, okay, I, I'm not crazy. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. we've been through this. It was traumatic. We all survived. It's almost, you know, um, we, I always say, you know, being in the military, it's like a club, you know, mm -hmm. like you went through something very similar and mm -hmm. we survived and we're here and yeah. um, same with the drug induced lupus. It's like, oh, we did it. We did it. We made it to the other end. And um, you and I made it to the other end and had very similar reactions, which was another yeah. thing that I thought was so amazing because I got through and I immediately recognized that I was super angry and that was not doing me any good. Not right. that it wasn't just, but it was not productive. Exactly. And I said, you know what, I've got to do something that is positive and productive to get through this or else I'm just going to end up dying. Because even though it was better, I still the mm -hmm. mental health aspect of it. I was just so depressed and just anxious and yeah. all the things. So I said, let me make something positive out of this. And I just jumped into a podcast, a blog, volunteer work. I love and you, yeah. the same. you jumped in with the Crohn's yeah. and Colitis Foundation, which is now your job. Yeah. So you started, um, what was the first club you or it was a committee you got involved in yeah i mean crazily enough the drug induced lupus is literally like not just the disease but the the drug induced lupus is what fueled it like what fueled my involvement where i got started because when i was laying on the couch and laying in bed and i felt so lonely the mental aspect i felt so low and just unworthy because i could not get out of bed and do anything with my body um, I couldn't work. Like I just felt so low that I was like, I know I need to find community, um, who have been through similar things or going through similar things, because if not, like, I'm going to lose my mind at that point. Mm -hmm. I didn't have like anyone in my life that had been through it and understood. And so I like created a, um, anonymous in uh, Instagram account that day because I was like, I just want to be able to talk about my symptoms and not feel embarrassed by it and I want to be able to talk to people who get it so I created a um anonymous Instagram to be able to talk unashamed and that's where I met people who were already involved with the foundation um and I stumbled actually into um the first committee I joined was the young leadership board um for Baltimore at the time when the uh in our Maryland chapter and um I got to meet other young professionals who are going through similar things, but also not just like sit and like be sad together, but also like mm -hmm. do something about it. And so like we were actively fundraising for the organization. Um, together we were, you know, trying to promote the, the young leadership committee to other people to get them involved. Like we were just actively like trying to bring solutions to it, which I think was really helpful. Uh, for me at that point, I needed something to keep me like have something with hope that I could work toward. 
that's that's the key something with hope because you feel so traumatized and alone that it's the hope um i felt the same thing i think that's a really good word hope you know once i yes did my first podcast and wrote started writing my blog i thought you know what i think i'm you know and i, I did start reaching people you know and now i've been meeting others who've been suffered from drug induced lupus and who've gone through these traumatic experiences and just having those people there to speak, it does give you so much hope. It's, exactly. Um, I think, so I got involved in that way. And then that's when I attended uh, Take Steps in Maryland. And I felt like that was the first time I ever felt like I was surrounded by a community of people who really understood. And at that point, I was kind of, I mean, I wasn't on the other side of the drug-induced lupus quite yet. I, I had, I think I had like just ended Remicade and was uh, switched to the next drug. But I was like recovering from it still. And I was on a high dose of steroids. So I had like the moon face and I had felt like I gained a lot of weight and I was still, I was really symptomatic in my GI at that point because I'd been on steroids and I, it was just like messing me up in all sorts of ways. And so um, I remember just feeling like really comfortable um, there because it felt like I belonged and wouldn't, you know, like people aren't going to judge me if I had to <laughs> like, take forever in the bathroom and someone was waiting. Like it's not, people aren't going to get angry or whatever. Um, like I knew that people understood why I had the moon face and I didn't have to like feel self-conscious, you know, which is huge. Um, and so when that happened, when I was at that event, I was like, this is so healing, um, in so many ways. And, um, this is like, I knew like I wanted to get more involved because for me, I I've always felt like I've been so goal. I'm always been very goal or oriented. I'm always like very volunteer based. I've worked in nonprofits my whole career. And when I was, you know, even before that in college and high school, like I've always been service oriented. So there's always been that part of my extracurricular activities and everything. But, um, I felt like, okay, if I can get involved to take steps, like fundraising is a great way for me because I really like, like I've always been in that space in the fundraising space. So it's perfect. Right. Um, and I'm like goal oriented. I can set a monetary amount and help, like I have hope to get to it and, and being able to contribute in that way just felt like really impactful. Um, knowing that my, my like time and my money was and the money that I was raising from other friends and family was going to something that could directly impact my future and the quality of life that I have like felt very powerful. And it was also a way I think for me to take back control um, a little bit when I felt like I lost all control of my life, right? When I lost all control of my abilities, it was a, my way of being like, Crohn's disease, you're not taking like everything from me. I have this amount of control and I'm going to use it. Um, and so take steps in the foundation, I think gave me that outlet to be like, hopeful for something, find community where I felt like I was supported and then also feel like I was like actually making an impact and could help my future self and all of the younger versions of myself. I always, oh gosh, I get so emotional whenever I think about it, but whenever I think about like the brand new diagnosed version of myself or like the version of myself that was laying on that couch with drug induced lupus, but didn't know it yet. If I can do, if I could do say one thing to those versions of myself it would just you know be like you're you're not alone like there is hope there is there hope is. i think that was i asked everybody you know what do you wish you knew when you were first diagnosed and that's all you know it's almost always what comes out there's hope exactly you know, don't let it take you down don't let it um and i think that's why both of us had those similar reactions to give back to get involved right. to do something because all i think of each day is you know i got through it but, you know, life is chances, you know, you never know what each day is going to bring and how you're going to react. And I, I think to myself, I, I, I could have ended it all at some point because I definitely thought about it. Right. Um, I, you know, when I asked myself, how did I make it through? It's, you know, a combination of my husband who, you know, is supportive and I, I just didn't want to leave him with the trauma of having to, to discover my dead body that for some, that was something that always stuck in my head. Like, no, I just don't want to do that. And then my Crohn's support dogs, you know, for the people yeah. watching the video, they know I got my Crohn's support dog, Sunny here with me. Um, but why did I not? I, I don't always know. So can we do something to, you know, 
reach those people? That's that's right. what's always on my mind. How do we reach the people who are in that dark place yeah. who may not be able to get out of it on their own? Maybe they don't have their Crohn's support talk or exactly. you know, that that's something in their head that's saying, no, no, you know, give it give it another chance. Try again, try again, get it up, get it up, get up. Um, because it is a very lonely and sad place to be, you know? Yeah, definitely. And I think, um, literally everything that I've done since that point from toward my career, um, the only reason that I do this work is so that I could be like that voice or that hope for one other person out there. Mm -hmm. I just like can never, I, I, I'll never stop thinking about how alone I felt. And if I hadn't met people who understood how I probably like, it would just be such a different experience. Right. Like it would, I don't, you know, I don't know how it would have ended up because exactly. thank God I didn't find out. Um, but just to go through it alone. And, and again, I came from a very like privileged place and I was able to not work for a month and I had a shared income. Like I wasn't living alone. Right. Yeah. Um, and so many times I have health care and a husband. Exactly. Don't worry. I've got gotcha. you. I had a really understanding job at that point. Um, and I had like caregivers in my life. Um, and like I said, like not living alone is huge, but um, I just think about all the people who are in such different circumstances, you know, people who like literally cannot afford to miss a single day of work, yep. um, not just with Crohn's, but like to go through this this experience where you're in so much pain, you physically cannot move, but like they're either going to work or they're not going to make rent or they're not going to be able to get groceries that week or get gas. And, you know, well, like we learned the hard way, right. That being disabled in the United States is not an right. easy task. You know, exactly. if you're yeah. going to be disabled, it's almost like, well, I hope you married well or have fam a family with money to take care of you. It's a, it's a very, very, scary and difficult place to be. Um, yeah, it's terrible. I, 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 you know, I, and I never knew as much as I do now. Yeah, no, I didn't either. And then, you know, also if you, if you do get disability, if you are able to claim disability, then you aren't able to, um, okay. you know, make any money or really do anything at all in any sort of revenue way, which is, and it's not enough, it's not a lot of money and if you're the sole provider for kids that like that's not realistic so it just like is something that i think about like so often how privileged i was in that circumstance and still how hard and absolutely devastating it was for me and so for people who might not have had that community or um who didn't have like you know the help financially and uh mm -hmm all of that, it's just, it's a completely different experience. So I just like, we'll never stop talking about it. And then I'll never stop talking about just how lonely and just, I don't know, even the right word. It's just devastating. This disease can be, you know, yeah, that, traumatic is like the perfect word. So it's been said to me multiple times by the doctors that I see, you know, and they've all use that word. Well, what you went through was very traumatic, right? Well, yeah, yeah, it was, you know, and, 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 and that's why I just, you know, I, I hope to see many, many podcasts, of, you know, between the two of us because yeah. myself every day, what can we do to make this yeah. better? You know, how do we ensure that this doesn't happen to anybody else? How do we ensure that right. doctors know better, you know, what this looks like so that when somebody who's taking a drug like Humira or Remicade comes in and says, my muscles feel like they're tearing apart. The doctor can look at that and say, oh my goodness, it might be your Remicade, it might be your Humira. Um, you know, and what can we do to make disability better for people like us? You know, one of the things I, I think, you know, you, you know, you know what it is. You go through all of this and I tried to, you know, just ram through it all because that's who I am. Mm -hmm. Don't need help, don't worry about me, got it all together. Um, but if we could have, you know, something out there to help with employment, you know, and, and make it easy to find, uh, you know, I've had podcasts with people who, who, who deal with this all the time with disability and the paperwork and the bureaucracy, and you've got to be pretty on top of, you know, yeah. 
bureaucracies to know how to even get what you can get to, to for help. And, you know, every time a doctor would say to me, when I'd say, I can't go to work, like <laughs> they say, well, why don't you just apply for a disability? You know, and all the things you said, but on top of that, I don't want disability. Right. I, I, I don't, I want to go to work, whatever right. that means. Maybe, maybe I need to be retrained in something. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want disability monthly money. Maybe you have a program that will, you know, give me a skill set that, you know, can keep me, you know, working from home all the time if that's yeah. what I would needed or, um, you know, any, you know, any, all these things that could be done for people like us. Definitely. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. And um, I think what I learned a lot when I went through this experience, because I think I've always really, a lot of people, a lot of us <laughs> rely heavily on um, uh, like we equate our worth with our productivity and our ability to climb the rank at work, right. And the ability to do the best work possible and produce the best results at work. And I'm definitely one of those, you know, like former straight A student now burnout, like yes. <laughs> kind of people where it's like, I burnt myself out by you. Yeah. Yeah. By just like going too hard by being too, just 100% all the time. And I learned through chronic illness and through this experience with drug induced lupus, just that it's not always realistic for me to give my 100% because if I give 100% today, I'll be able only to give 30% tomorrow. Like that's yeah. just how it is. And so sometimes I need to conserve that energy and only give 50% um, each of these days. And, you know, I don't just mean like even with work, I mean, you know, if I, if I have a, a day where I'm out at meetings all day, I know I can't go out to dinner with friends at night. I need to immediately come home, eat dinner and go to bed. Like I need to recover. So being able to prioritize the things. Um, and I mean, we live in a society and in America where like, it's very much programmed. Like the more you do, the more productive you are, the better yeah. member of a society you are, the more valued you are, the better mother you are, the better partner you are, whatever. And it's just so exhausting. And so when we literally physically cannot do that, it's so easy to fall down on ourselves and just get so upset and feel like you're not worth anything. I think I struggled with that a lot during this experience is just feeling and like I was literally worth nothing because I wasn't able to get out of bed. I wasn't able to do the household work I was supposed to do. I wasn't like taking care of my partner the way I was supposed to be doing. I wasn't taking care of myself. Like, you know, I wasn't being a good friend because I couldn't answer calls and texts and I couldn't go to my goddaughter's birthday. And, you know, not to even mention the work piece of it. Like I, I didn't go to work for a month. I mean, and that was like a really hard pill for me to swallow at first that I wouldn't be able to do those things. Not just like that. I, you know, the idea that, okay, there's some things I literally physically cannot push through. Like my body cannot do this and that's okay. That was mm -hmm. like a really hard thing for me um, to get through and, and to like fully believe that like my body cannot do things and that's okay. Like that doesn't make me any less worthy of a human that doesn't make me a bad person. Like that doesn't mean literally anything about me other than the fact that my body can't do it. Right. Um, so I, think I learned so learned. much from that. I had to remind myself of it, but you know what? So hard still. I feel like, I still feel like less of a person because I can't do the things physically I want or yeah. you know, my big thing was competition. I can't, there's mm -hmm. no me. Well, when we do a triathlon again, heck if I know my body right. can't, do it. it does make me feel like less of a person. You know. It took me, I mean, when I went through the drug-induced lupus, I think it was 2018 um, into 2019. And so it, it has taken me um, literally since then. Like, I still have to think about it every day. And I'm at a healthier point now with my Crohn's and with my joints and everything where I don't have to, like, I'm not um, as symptomatic all the time. And so there aren't, like, I'm not, like, missing a week for work for a week, but I still have days that come up. And so I'll get, you know, one or two of those days, like a month. And I literally still have to remind myself and my partner does a great job too of reminding me. Cause I'll be like, like, I can't do anything around the house today. And I'll be like, that, that's, that's fine. Like you don't have to, like, you can just rest. It's and I have to remind myself because I feel like, um, once I got healthier again, you know, I, I put that expectation back on myself. And so just having to remind myself constantly that, there's nothing wrong with me for not being able to do certain things. It doesn't make me any less 
good of a person. It doesn't make me less any worthy, any less lovable. That's a huge, huge thing too. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's like, it's not something that you just like learn and then it's like all good. It's something you have to continue to practice and remind yourself constantly. Daily. Yes. It's very difficult to get through. We, we've got to come up with something. We, you and me, we've got to come up yeah. with a program. We got to put out a communication, something. Yeah. You know, what does drug induced lupus look like? Start t- calling these doctors. I think we can do it. Um, you I know, know, I love your hope. I, you know, like I said, every time I ask everybody, what do you wish you knew when you were first diagnosed? I love to hear about the hope because I think that is what's so important to just know that it really it's not, it may even take a long time. You know, like I, I never, like the Humira never really, I mean, it would get me where I could function, but right. it was, you know, it was never that good. Now that I'm on Stellar, I believe it or not, I'm in symptom free remission. Mm, that's amazing. I mean, it's pretty freaking, I've, I, I've never been here since I've had Crohn's. It's yeah. almost surreal. Like, oh, is this what this is about? So it can happen. Even when you don't think it can, because I thought, well, this is just me. You know, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna be having bad symptoms for the rest of my life. Exactly. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I okay. Two things to say coming out of that. One is, I feel like I always now I know, and what I would tell other people who are like really struggling and suffering is that it always gets better. No matter mm-hmm. if it's a flare, if it's a bad day, if it's like the disease has been tearing you apart for five years. Like it literally always gets better at some point it gets better. And whether, you know, that get better lasts for a day, a week, a month, a year, 10 years, it always happens. And then, you know, you have that to look forward to and you have that to enjoy. And so it, it's really hard because those like better periods can be small and they can be like, you know, few in between, but you just have to like, remember that it's not always going to feel that way. It's not always going to feel like this. And that's temporary as hard as that is when you're chronically ill, because it's not really temporary. Um, it's yeah. just, you know, temporary for this time. But um, I just always have to rem- remind myself of that because that was something I too struggled with. Yes. Um, and then what was the second part of what you just said that I wanted to make sure to, Oh, the, okay. The, can we just talk about like the trauma then? So, Yes. When you come back, when you start to feel good, right? Like you, you're like, you're symptom free in remission. Are you not terrified? Like I still am terrified every day that it's going to happen to me again. Like I'm literally terrified. I don't know if I might have a little bit of like a, a pain or me too. breathing. I'm like, it's one of the drugs I'm on. And I'm like throwing drugs and trying to figure out what I'm coming off. <laughs> no, I'm, I, it, and I think too, for me, like, so I feel like I, I didn't get like a hard set resolution from my doctors. Like they were never, they never wanted to like completely confirm drug induced lupus because I think they just were unaware. They didn't know. And they didn't know how to be like, yes, that's definitely what it is, you know? And so they were always like, yeah, like we, we think it could be this drug induced lupus, but like, you know, it could just be your body's having a bad reaction to Remicade. It, it was just like the most non-committal and un Same. like satisfying resolution. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think for me too, I have a lot of fear around well, what if it just happens again? What if it like, it wasn't a fluke, right? What if it wasn't drug induced lupus? Like what if that was just like a really bad flare? I don't know. I have this where I just like struggle and I'm like, what if it comes back? Like, and I have the same exact thing where I'll, if my, if I have a bad joint day where I start to really like, Get, I get like sciatic pain. And if the sciatic pain starts to like flare up, I'm like, oh my gosh, um, <laughs> it's happening again. If my fingers swell, it's happening again. And it's just like terrifying. And then I go into like, I like automatically assume the worst and I start to get really down on myself mentally. And I start to freak out a little bit. And I have to like, I literally always have to like pause and be like, okay, what are the coping skills and the coping mechanisms that we learned? Yeah. One is to never panic, right? One is to never panic. And when you panic, you create more stress in your body and that only leads to worse problems. So like, we got to like calm down a minute. The second is to assess the situation, right? And like figure out what you can do. But um, it's so hard because the trauma that you have coming out of that, the, I think the fear, it's just the fear that it's going to happen to me again. And I think it's even though, you know, maybe we'll never go through that again. Hopefully not. The fear is real. It's so scary to think about um, and wonder, what if I go through that again? 
especially because it was just so painful and traumatic. So the trauma, of course, continues on with your fear and your anxiety right. that you make it do it again. But it, it's also compounded remembering just how traumatic the actual event was. Yeah. Um, it's just horrific. And I think, you know, one of, there's so many things that I've learned out of this. And, you know, we talk about hope, it's, it's going to get better. But, you know, the other thing is, it's okay to say I need help. Mm, yes. Now, say I need help. I, I can't do this by myself because it is so difficult. And of course, now knowing we have a community and, you know, I want to somehow figure out a way to put together a more cohesive community of drug-induced lupus survivors. Yeah. Because every time one of us meets the other one, it's like, oh my gosh, you understand. You get it. Like, we yeah. all have the same experiences and we've all dealt with it differently. Uh, but the trauma's there, the experience is there. And, you know, again, you and me, we, we, we both responded so similarly. I just want nothing more than to find a way to make this better for everybody, educate medical professionals, get everybody on board with understanding what drug uh, induced lupus is. What are these um, side effects? What is the FDA doing? That's not communicating this to doctors. I mm -hmm. have a new doctor who I like, he's really doing a lot to help me. He listens to me. He's an Ironman athlete. So he gets what I'm saying. I'm not just, you know, we speak the same language. Mm -hmm. And even he was like, well, you know, these TNF blockers, they, they can cause drug induced lupus, but the incidence is lower than all other drugs. And I'm like, um, Hey, look here, buddy. I didn't go to medical school, but when I can just go about life and continually just randomly meet people who are like, Oh yeah, you know what? I had that same reaction to Humira or, Oh no, my brother just went through that. Or mm -hmm. you know, my is going through that right now. That doesn't sound like a very low rare instance to me. Right. It sounds to me like the FDA and these pharmaceutical companies are not doing enough to get this communicated to medical professionals and patients. Um, and, you, and you can't easily, I, I told you, I'm just going through unreal loads of data from the mm -hmm. FDA that's taking me forever to read, but there's no easy way to, to find out. You know, as a, as a doctor in a perfect world, um, a doctor or one of the staff should be able to every quarter quickly download the adverse reactions to each drug that they prescribe and take a quick look at it to see if there's anything new or different that they should be aware of. But you can't easily do that. It takes right. so much work computing data and just they, whoever's in charge of that over at the FDA is not a communications person. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if we could just get the message out there and, and just reach people. Cause I know, you know, you, you and I felt the same way. So right now, as we're speaking, recording this podcast, somewhere out there, there's somebody who feels alone, depressed, anxious, suicidal, and they're in severe pain because they don't know what's happening to them and nobody can help them. Exactly. Yeah, no, I think you're, you're right on. Um, and I think, um, you know, I just, I like wonder, you know, the statistics about drug induced lupus, I wonder how much of it is just that doctors are like almost a little bit hesitant to diagnose that and report it because they, it's, I guess, hard to pinpoint, which I, yeah. which I understand, but like, what do we need to do so that we can pinpoint it? And that my doctor could have said to me, like, in a hard, absolute answer, yes, this is drug induced lupus. Mm -hmm. Um, and here's how you can avoid it in the future. And here's, Here's why it happened to you. Um, and here's what recovery looks like. Like, I think that's a huge thing too, is just no one would, you know, talk to me about what recovery from drug induced lupus looks like, how long it takes. I mean, I swear it took years, um, of, you know, and just. And I started my symptoms in 2020, my very last dose of Humira, I believe it was September 26, 2021. And here we are you know, March 13th, 2023, and I'm still dealing with these symptoms and every doctor has something a little different to say, you yeah. know, well, you, could be dealing, you may never recover. You could be experiencing this for years. Oh, your PTSD from the army is making it worse. You know, I have all of these different things and nobody can just give me a quick treatment plan right. to say, okay, we'll be done with this in another four months. Yeah. 
So it's, yeah. Yeah. there's just so much that we need to know. NIH, are you out there? Students, does somebody want a project? Does, right. does somebody, you know, even if we could just codify this in any way so that more doctors can understand, patients can understand. Um, as a matter of fact, after all the doctors I've seen, I, for the first time, um, a neurologist I saw, Walter Reed, um, actually said to me, and it, it just, I, you know, it didn't even occur to me, which is funny because I feel like I've tried to cover all bases, but he said to me, you're, you're not a candidate for a lot of drugs any longer because you've had this reaction. And I thought, mm. oh, well, uh, you know, I guess he's, I mean, and no other doctor had said it, which says to me, maybe they're not really looking at all the drugs yep. that may or not, may not be to mm -hmm. see if this is something that could cause a reaction in somebody who's already had a reaction to a TNF blocker and had drug induced lupus. So, um, you know, again, that says to me that there's doctors all over this country who just roll right past that and maybe diet, you know, uh, prescribe a drug to a patient who probably shouldn't have it. Mm -hmm. Right. Based on previous it, reaction. It just makes me wonder, like, what kind of research is being done on like drug induced lupus on, you know, how it happens, why it happens and, 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 and who will it happen? Right. Like, um, the work that's being done for IBD, I mean, there's millions of dollars going into the research, but um, the specific little subset of it um, is so tiny. I mean, tiny, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, just thinking like, you know, they're, they're working on a project where um, hopefully in the future we'll be able to take a blood test from a patient and be able to say what biologics will not work and will work for them. Yes. And so with that, yeah, like how can we use that and that that study and that data to be able to figure out like you know, why drug induced lupus happens to some people and and like and Potomac Psychiatry, who I did um, an episode with a couple of weeks ago, uh, Doctor Care, he he does that kind of work. He'll, he'll wow. if you go to That's see Doctor Care, mm -hmm. he will you know do a blood panel. And he will come back and because you, you know how it is with yeah. chronic disease. It's, well, we'll try this. Nope, yep. that didn't work. Okay, let's throw this at it. And let's see what happens. And we basically lose months, years of our life just trying to identify the drug that's going to work. It took me 10 years to get to Stellara. Um, but he does that and he says, nope, okay, the correct drug for you is Wellbutrin. And that's it. And I love that. And, you know, he's continually doing work on things like long COVID and whatnot. So I'm excited to hear more about what Dr. Care, you know, yeah. may have. Absolutely. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, and I honestly haven't heard of that before. Um, so with, with that aspect of it, uh, with the mental health aspect. So I think that's like important work that's being done. And I hope we start to talk about that more. Definitely. Definitely. Well, thank you for coming on. This is just part one. I want us to keep going every time we, you know, come up with something else. Yeah, we're, I know we're going to come up with something brilliant to, to address this drug-induced lupus problem. I think so, too. Um, and we'll, we'll have episodes, you know, part two, three, four, 10, 12. Congratulations. We mm -hmm. finally got some legislation through yeah, something, definitely. you know, to get this done. So thank you again, Marissa, and thank you for being on Living Chronic. Of course, thank you.